So now we're going to talk about parasites, and um, parasites are going to be considered to be predators because they are harming the host, right? So what a parasite does is it's going to get nourishment in some way, shape, or form from the host, and the host is going to get some harmed in some way, shape, or form. It could just be lack of nutrients. It could be worse with disease or something like that. So there's two types. You have endoparasites and ectoparasites. Endo means in, ecto means out, right? So endoparasites are going to live inside the host, and ectoparasites are going to live on the outside of the host. So I have some lovely pictures in case if you are, you know, just dying to see them. Um, so you can see an endoparasite would be like this tapeworm who's going to hook to the inside of your gut and get all of your nutrients. And then an ectoparasite would be like a tick or a flea or something like that. Okay. So um, going along with that, we have parasitoidism. And parasitoidism is going to be where a parasite actually ends up killing the host. A lot of times the point of that is in the process of killing the host, they're going to get expelled in a way that they can get distributed somewhere else. Um, now you're going to have some parasites that are going to be considered to be pathogenic, and that's because they actually spread disease while they're being parasitic. Perfect example, mosquitoes, right? Mosquitoes can give you West Nile. They can give you um, malaria. Um, the tsetse fly can give you sleeping sickness. Um, ticks can give you Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease. Those are all pathogenic par um, parasites. Okay, now off to the nice stuff. <laughs> so we're off the gross stuff. Um, these are going to be some in examples of how organisms can live together and actually not harm each other. So mutualism and commensalism are going to be these examples. Mutualism is going to be where you have two species living together and they're both getting some sort of benefit from the interaction. So I have some pictures to show you what I'm talking about there. Um, first example, acacia trees and ants. So acacia trees are found in like the savannas of Africa and what ends up happening with them is they get um, eaten by herbivores, right? But on the tree, they do have thorns, but they also have these ants that live on them. And these little swollen areas you see here are nectaries. So they provide nectar for the ants to feed on. And in turn, when an herbivore actually bites into the plant, it releases a pheromone to tell the ants to actually attack the herbivore. So the herbivore is not going to go back if it gets attacked by these biting ants. So that's a mutualistic setup, right? The tree is benefiting from the ants defending it, and the ants have a place to live and free food. Um, this up here is going to be a picture of coral, and coral actually has something living on it called zooxanthellae, and that's um, going to be a type of protist. And so the, the protist is actually given a place to live and nutrients, and in turn, it provides photosynthetic nutrients to the coral, and um, so they have that protection as well. So that's going to be their mutualistic setup. And then down here, one of my favorites, this is a cleaning station. So I actually studied these in Belize, and they're just so awesome. So what happens is you have like these little cleaner shrimp, like in Finding Nemo. Um, you've got cleaner shrimp. You've got cleaner wrasses, all different types of fish. And what they're going to do is these bigger fish have parasites in their gills and on their scales. And so these guys actually go in and clean them up. So um, the... Shrimp are getting a benefit because they have food, and the big fish are getting a benefit because they get cleaned, right? So that's kind of how they can um, have that mutualistic setup. And those things are so cool. You can actually, it looks like a car wash. Like you'll see all the fish just kind of lined up one behind the other, and they're just waiting. And then once one gets cleaned, the next one pulls up and that one flies away. It's just awesome. So those are mutualism. Now, the way I remember that is they're both mutually benefiting from the situation. The next examples I'm going to give you are commensalism, and commensalism is going to be where one is getting a benefit and the other one isn't really getting anything. They're not getting hurt, they're not getting helped. So the first example is going to be this clownfish and the anemone. So what happens is the clownfish actually can live within this, um, which is crazy, right? Because the anemone is, is a stinging organism. So they secrete a mucus sheath that actually protects them. So they get the protection from the anemone, but the anemone doesn't really get much from them, right? So that's commensal. Um, over here, I love these guys. You've got the water buffalo, and then you've got this egret that lives on his head um, or on his body. Well, the egret likes to eat insects. So what it does is it'll sit, stand on his head, and as the buffalo moves through the grass, it actually disturbs all the insects, and the bird can just murmur, murmur, eat all of the insects, and it gets a benefit from that. And sometimes it'll pick off parasites, but not very often. 
And then the last example is going to be the whale. Um, this is a side of a whale that you see here with barnacles growing on it. Now, obviously, the whale doesn't get any benefit or harm from the barnacles growing on it, but the barnacles are filter feeders. And what better way to filter feed than to just stick your arm out while you're going, you know, 10 miles an hour through the ocean, right? So they're getting that benefit, but the whale isn't really getting anything. So that's going to be commensalism. Now, what can happen as a result of either of these relationships is something called co-evolution. And that's where if one starts to evolve, the other one is going to get pressure to evolve to maintain that relationship. So um, that ha has happened throughout the fossil record. It's kind of interesting to think about. Okay, in the next part, we're going to start talking about food webs and that type of thing.